Uh, every, IPCC is really well known for the, the assessment reports that it puts out. But IPCC does a little bit more than that, and IPCC produces methodology reports, which are perhaps less well known, but perhaps even more central to the, the UNFCCC process. Um, being able to inventory and, 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 and quantify greenhouse gas emissions is really what spurs action and, and understanding how greenhouse gas emissions are evolving, which countries are emitting how much, from what sources, is really what guides policy and, and, and guides international and national action on, on mitigating greenhouse gases. So the IPCC produces uh, guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventory. And I joined the, the IPCC efforts for this back in 2004 when we produced the, the 2006 guidelines. And one of the gaps in the 2006 guidelines was the lack of data and lack of ability to put together emissions factors for tropical wetlands. The, the, the 2006 guidelines had uh, five volumes. The fourth volume was the one on agriculture, forestry, and, and land use. And um, the, the agriculture, forestry, land use covered six land uses. It covered forest lands, crop lands, grasslands, settlements, other, other lands and wetlands. And a lot of the wetlands was actually dealt with in an appendix there because the, the data was inadequate and the data was, was uh, um, uh, controversial. Um, the emissions factors that were put out for tropical wetlands, were for, particularly for nitrous oxide and methane, were essentially the temperate factors multiplied by two because the emissions had to be much higher in the tropics. There was no data for the tropical emissions factors and there was actually precious little data for, for good emissions factors in, in the temperate zone. And that, sort of, that, that lack, I think, spurred the, the scientific community to, to invest time and, and, and um, effort to, to collect some of that data. Um, and so the, the wetland supplement was commissioned and began work in, in 2011 on that. The, the, the supplement was finally accepted in 2013 at the IPCC plenary in Batumi, Georgia, and, and published uh, earlier this year, in, in, or earlier last year in 2014. But I want to talk a little bit about the review process that it goes through. The, the IPCC publications go through a very rigorous review process. Um, for example, in the expert review, which was the, the review of the first audit draft that we put out, we had over 5,000 comments from 128 experts across the, the globe. And 1,400 of those comments were on the chapter that I happened to be, to, to draw by chance, right? So I was working on the, the drain inland organic soils, which is essentially emissions from peatlands and mucks. Um, and, and that was one of the most controversial chapters. Um, it, it then went out for, for a government and expert review. The first review is only done by experts. The second review is done by, by experts and governments. It came back with almost 4,000 comments. And about eight 900 comments were on that particular chapter. It then goes out for a final government review after we respond, responded to two rounds of review, and, and we still had another 350-odd comments coming back. And I think about uh, 50 or, or so of the comments were, were on the, the, wetland, the, the uh, organic soils chapter. Um, but the, the, the drained organic soils chapter pro provides updated methods and updated emissions factors for uh, these inventories. Governments, when they do not have enough data to complete their inventory, we, the IPCC provides what we call tier one emissions factors. And a tier one emissions factor is the best scientific guess we can make that's better than zero. Okay, so when we don't have, when a country doesn't have data, and when a, an emission source is a minor portion of a country's national greenhouse gas inventory, they use these tier one factors. If the emission source is a large portion of the, the, either the, 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 the total emissions or the total uncertainty around the inventory, countries need to invest in generating data. But typically we see, see um, countries doing what we call tier 1.5. They have a little bit of data, they, they, they mix it with some IPCC methods, and, and they produce uh, greenhouse gas inventories this way. And, and, and this is very much the case in, in many tropical countries where, where countries don't have a lot of, of um, data and a lot of scientific capacity to go around generating the, these emissions factors. Um, so we, we dealt with these, uh, the, the, to, to, so to put these together, we had to, to delve into the literature and actually pull information out of a wide range of studies. And, and I, I want to underline, there, there are two major methods that, that are used to quantify greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm going to talk primarily about carbon, because carbon was, was the, is the big, it's the big number, and it's also the, the controversial number. There are two methods to estimate carbon emissions from drained peatlands. One is to actually put chambers out over the soil, and these chambers are typically about a quarter of a, of a square meter. Um, and, and you put the, spread them around a site, and you take, uh, takes measurements of, of the carbon coming out of the soil. We use an infrared gas analyzer to do that. It's a very technical process. It requires teams in the field making measurements. 
Um, and and it, it requires an intensity of sampling because you want to ca capture the whole annual cycle, but you also want to begin to try and capture interannual variability because rain that falls on the, the peatlands has an effect. Fertilization, uh, if, you're, if you're dealing with cr uh, crops on peatlands, has effects on, on, on the carbon dioxide emissions. So, so it requires a fairly labor-intensive um, uh, approach. A second approach looks at subsidence. So when you take the water out of a peatland, peatlands are naturally formed as a dome. You, you have sort of in between two rivers or in between two drainages, um, rivers or streams. You have a, a, a sort of an elevated area um, between those. As you take the water out and drain, the, that elevated area begins to collapse. And the collapse is a result of actually four processes, only one of which is greenhouse gas emissions. Okay? You have compaction. As the weight of the soil uh, builds up over, over the drained area, because you, you drain to a certain level, there's also pressure on the area below the, the, the water table where there's, there's still a lot of buoyancy that, that results in some uh, compression of that layer. There's also shrinkage and swell, and, and that, that's particularly important for short-term measurements when, when you're trying to, to look at uh, subsidence, when you're trying to measure the rate of change of the elevation. As the rain falls onto the surface, the fibers can shrink and swell, and, and this shrink and swell could be as much as 30% of the annual variation of these um, uh, the, the, this, the, the, the rise and, uh, and fall of the, the, the peat surface. And for short-term measurements, this actually poses a lot of problems, because if, you're, if you have an uncertainty of about 30% uh, of, your, your, uh, of how much substance has occurred in the course of a year, you have maybe 30% uncertainty introduced in your, your estimate of what the, the, the emissions are. Um, so we, had, we were challenged by, by putting these two methods together, but also dealing with all the uncertainties of these methods as we put these emissions factors together. Um, and so we, we took a couple of different approaches. I don't know if, if anyone has read Nate Silver's book. Uh, it's called um, uh, uh, The Signal and the Noise, how to, how, how, why certain relationships hold up and others don't. Um, and, or, or why certain projections hold up and others don't. So it's all about how, how to use data to, to, for prediction and how we often misuse data for prediction. One of the, the things that he underlines is that when you have a lot of uncertainty, there, there's a robustness in approaching a problem from multiple directions and then taking the average. You do a much better job than, because it tends to average out the biases of the different people um, and the different, different uh, uh, approaches. And so that's essentially what we did. So for each one of the, these, uh, these studies that we looked at, all of them were incomplete, all of them had assumptions. Um, and so we, we then, we took some, we did a sort of site, we did site by site calculations, we did some generic calculations, we, we took, you know, we, we did, looked at a mass balance approach, and we figured the best number we could get out of all the studies that had anything to say about root mortality and turnover, anything that had anything to say about litter fall, because these are the input terms to your, your mass balance. These, this is the, the carbon that's coming into your peat system. We, we looked at everything that had, that quantified total emissions from, from soil respiration, which is what's most commonly measured in, by chamber measurements. We looked at, at what was the best estimate of the fraction of that that actually comes from peat decomposition. Um, and so we did these generic calculations and we then compared them with the best estimate of the site by site calculations, also filling in the gaps. We did the same thing for the substance study. So very often the, 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 the um, the, the, the rate of elevation was measured, but perhaps carbon density wasn't measured, or bulk density, or change in bulk density was measured. We, had, we were missing a lot of longitudinal uh, uh, information. People didn't have initial pre-drainage um, uh, data in a lot of cases. And so we put those all together, and we came up with, with a set of emissions factors that we think are, are reasonably robust given the current data set. And those emissions factors range from a fairly low level of about uh, one and a half tons of carbon per hectare per year for, for low intensity cultivation systems like sago palm. Um, or sago is a cycad that, that's produced here. It's, it's, it's an important staple. It's basically grown in undrained conditions or very lightly drained conditions. The, the most intensive, uh, the, most, the highest emissions factor of, w that we found was associated with acacia plantations. All acacia plantations happen in, uh, essentially in Riau, Jambi, and, and uh, Sumatra Celaton, and we came up with an estimate of about 20 tons of carbon per hectare per year. So there's a wide variation, you know, we're going bet and between one and a half and, and, and 20 tons of carbon per hectare per year. Oil palm, the average fell at around 11, um, and we, we found uh, a, a wide variation across the, the landscapes where oil palm was cultivated. So for example, in, in Sumatra, we have very high emissions on the order of, of, of 20, uh, 18 to 20, 22, 24 tons of carbon per hectare per year. In Malaysia, we found very low emissions in the literature, and, and on the order of, of six to eight uh, tons of carbon per hectare per year. Sarawak seems to be uh, closer to mainland Malaysia, um, southern uh, uh, Borneo, 
seems to be closer to, to Sumatra, but, but still lower than Sumatra. So when we average it all out, the, the, um, the oil palm comes out to around 11. And this created a bit of controversy because many, uh, many people believe that oil palm and acacia, because they're both deeply drained, um, have very high emissions. And so there was, there was a lot of, of questions raised around, you know, why do we have such, such different uh, numbers? The reality is that, that acacia, where acacia and oil palm are grown on, in similar conditions, we see very similar emissions. In Jambi, for example, or in Riau, if you, put, if you measure acacia plantations and, and you measure oil palm plantations near each other, you get very similar numbers. But all the data for our emissions factor for acacia are just from the Kampar Peninsula, from one part of Riau. So, so we don't have a good range of data over the whole area where, where it's grown, but also acacia isn't grown nearly as widely as oil palm. And, and oil palm is grown on, typically on shallow peats. Most of the data comes from, from deep peats. It's, it's, it's much more, it's very extensively grown on shallow peats in, in um, mainland Malaysia, and, and those data show, show very low values. So, so I think this, this averaging approach gave us a, a reasonably robust uh, uh, emissions factor. Certainly the best the data can provide, and, and at least now we have data-driven emissions factors for, for tropical peatlands. Um, and these, these emissions factors are important, in particular for Indonesia. And Indonesia is, actually, is using the IPCC emissions factors as a tier two factor because all the data come either from Malaysia or Indonesia. Okay? The, these, the measurements have not yet been made in Peru, and, and Christelle is starting some of that work in Peru right now, um, trying to get those numbers. Um, but the, the, it's, it's important because for Indonesia, 30 to 50 percent of the, the emissions come from these peatlands. And so getting a good number on that has been really important. I Indonesia has used these numbers in, in its reference emissions level, which we understand will be submitted in Paris. Um, it's using it in the Indonesian carbon accounting system. Um, so so the, the work that we were able to, to, to synthesize with our partners um, was in the IPCC is, is proving very useful. And, and I should uh, indicate that you know, the, the partnerships were, um, uh, it, you know, Christelle and I worked on the part of, of C4, but we also had partnerships um, from, um, from the Indonesian Soil Research Institute, Famun Agus worked with us on this, uh, Supiandi Sabiham from, from the university in, in Bogor worked with us on this, um, and we brought in a number of other uh, interested uh, parties to work with us on this, some people from the private sector, from people from the NGO sector, to, to help us sort through the data and come to a, a consensus on this. So I think we come to a reasonably good consensus. But I think there's some, some interesting lessons that we need to understand that, that, for, the, that for the science to, to be better, um, particularly, uh, and, and I'd like to separate the, these recommendations actually by, by method. So, so methods, it, scientists that are working on the, these substance methods are working with a lot of unvalidated assumptions. There's a lot of assumptions that, 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 uh, that shrink swell is, is not an important factor over very short term. Uh, measurements, and there's reason to believe that maybe that's not the case, and, and so we need to begin measuring that. There, there are assumptions that, that over short-term measurements, consolidation below the water table is, is negligible, and we can ignore those terms. We need to actually question those. The, the, these are some of the things that, that, that are being left out. So a lot of the, the parameters are actually poorly measured or, or, or not measured at all. And typically we see in the scientific literature that the things that are easy to quantify are the things that are quantified. So, so there's a lot of good measurements of, of the change in elevation of the peatlands, but all the underlying processes are not brought out. Um, and so we need to, 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 to begin doing that much better and, and, and making those measurements. We also need to be quantifying uncertainty much more robustly. Typically the, the, the substance literature publishes a value with no uncertainty. There's no standard error, there's no attempt at error propagation, no attempt at sensitivity analysis. And Crystal's done a nice sensitivity analysis and showed it's very easy to get a number that's, that's higher or lower than the average by a factor of two because of the sensitivity of a couple of key parameters, notably bulk density and carbon density of the, of the, the peak. Um, and the other problem with the method is there's no internal constraint. On, on, there's no way to set an upper or lower bound on the, the estimate as there is with some of the chamber-based methods. But the chamber-based methods also pose a number of problems. In most of the studies, a number of key parameters are not measured. When you put a chamber over soil, you're measuring total soil respiration, only part of which actually comes from peat decomposition because the roots that are in the, in the ecosystem with you also respire. And so, so not quantifying and not separating the root respiration from the, 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 the peat decomposition respiration makes it difficult to figure out just how much carbon you're losing from the system. Um, the inputs are often not measured, if you, and, and, and emission is just reported as the total CO2 that's going out of the system. It'd be a, that's the equivalent to, to measuring your bank account by, by just looking at the checks you write and not taking in the deposits, right? You eventually predict that you're going to run out of, of, of money, but you're not taking into account that you're actually putting money into your account, right? So you have to, we have to have better full mass balances in the studies that, that, are, that are being reported. Um, 
We need to understand the ecosystem processes better because we, we're at being asked to predict. We have very little data. We need to be developing better models, but you shouldn't develop complicated models when you have poor data. So we need to understand the underlying processes of what's controlling the temporal and the spatial variability of, of these emissions processes. Um, and the studies need better site descriptions. We, we, we had a real tough time in the IPCC actually understanding what had been measured. And, and site, there were many, many studies that looked like they were on a, a same site as another study, and it was very difficult. We actually had to call up the authors and find out, is this the same site or not? Um, so, so doing a better job of, of, of telling us where the sites are and describing the sites, describing the physical properties of the sites, the biological properties of the sites, really would help us um, do a much better job in these types of exercises. Now, I want to, to talk a little bit about some of the new challenges that are coming up. We, we've, we've finished the emissions factors. Um, they're there. They're, they're, they're available to be used. But, but that's only the beginning. Understanding just how much the emissions are is, is, is the first step. We need to, now we need to be looking at, and, and the international community and, and the local communities are interested in looking at what can we do about those emissions. And I've been hearing a lot lately over uh, opportunities for water table management. And this water table management idea, you, I hear it uh, talked about in the private sector. A April was talking about it at the Asia uh, Forest Summit. Um, APP has been talking about, you know, well, we're, we're working with, the, with some people in the consulting uh, companies to, to try and improve our water table management to reduce emissions. Um, with people in the NGO sector are talking about water table management. And, and you know, if we can raise, the idea is that if we can raise the water table, we can reduce emissions. And I think we've been looking at the, the, the data, and I, this is what's in the handout here. Um, and just, just walk very quickly through the handout. I, I was, there was a little bit of a mix-up. I was told at the beginning that I could present slides. Um, and then we realized that this format really doesn't lend itself to slides. But if we want to look at these controversies, we actually do have to look at a little bit of data. And, and this first graph here shows you a very clear relationship between water table depth and, and CO2 emissions. And it's these types of graphs that have led to the impression that if we change the water table depth, we can reduce emissions. There's two problems with this first graph that I have here. First of all, the CO2 on the, the left-hand axis is not peat decomposition CO2. It's total soil respiration. So it's root respiration plus peat respiration. The second problem, if you flip the page, becomes obvious, although the, the graph didn't print out as neatly as it would have projected. What I did was basically white out the line. And if you look at that data, do you see that relationship? I don't. If I had to draw a relationship, it would have a very slightly negative, uh, negative uh, axis because there is one point all the way in the middle here that's really high. It would probably tip the line to a, with a negative slope. So, so the relationship, that, and, and, and this graph was used to say for every 10 centimeters we raise the water table, we'll reduce emissions by 9.8, very precise number, 9.8 tons of CO2 per 10 centimeters that we raise the water table. What it should have said was maybe we'll be able to reduce it by between 4 and 24. And that the good average is about 9. But, but the relationship doesn't even hold up there. And, the, and this relationship isn't emission, it's, it's total loss. The, the next graph is, is our IPCC data. And you can see the oil pump, we also don't find a relationship between water table depth. And these are the site by site calculations. We don't see the, the, the relationship between water table depth. But for the acacia, we actually do see a very slight relationship. The relationship explains 15% of the variation. And all these data come from the same place. They all come from the Kampar Peninsula in Indonesia. So for the oil palms, the site to site variation swamps whatever signal there might be associated with drainage depth. And this is brought home even more clearly in the final graph, or the next to final graph, which is in a, in a degraded forest on one site, on a specific site where the water table goes up and down naturally over the course of the year. And there we see that below about to 20 centimeters, there's absolutely no effect on total soil respiration. So in order to actually do anything to reduce the soil, the, the, the amount of carbon coming out of that system, we have to bring the water table all the way back to the surface. Not a condition that most of these companies are talking about with, when they're talking about growing acacia plant, uh, acacias or, or oil palms. And the final graph shows that the rates of subsidence actually change over time. So a constant relationship between water table depth and subsidence, and then a, a, a constant relationship between subsidence and CO2 emissions over time is probably not a reasonable assumption. So I think that there's a new scientific challenge for us, and I think that the next generation of, of, of studies we need to actually look at, if companies want to begin improving their management, what are the management practices that are actually going to change the emissions? 
So we need, everything we have right now is based upon what we call natural experiments. There's no specific manipulation where we isolate a variable. What we do is we compare very different sites with very different drainage levels. And sometimes we see a relationship and sometimes we don't. We need to actually get in there and start manipulating water tables in determined ways and figuring out what does that do to the underlying processes. I think we also need to begin looking at, at nutrient management. Nutrient management is something that's not even being considered. But, car but peat has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 50 to 1. And so it's very recalcitrant to decomposition. And when you put acacias in, into these peatlands, they fix nitrogen. When you put oil palm in these, these, these areas, you put nitrogen fertilizer on them. You put phosphorus into them. Un understanding how much we can actually achieve. But I, I think that there's an assumption right now, and it's being promoted by, by, by the private, some people in the private sector, some people in, in, the, in the, the NGO sector, and it serves the interests of, of, of some of these companies that want to continue and actually sustainably manage on peatlands. The, 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 the narrative that we can actually do something about it. But I think the science is not yet there. And I think that's the next challenge for, uh, for us as scientists is to begin answering some of these questions. If you actually want to manage these peatlands, what can you do and what are the limits to what you can do? Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Lou, for this uh, not only tasty but also spicy presentation. <laughs> Uh, some controversy coming up. Uh, maybe there, is, there are some questions or comments. John. Thanks, thanks Luke. Great presentation. I, I remember that the, uh, the Indonesia-Australian program in central Kalimantan had mm -hmm. uh, the ambition to, uh, uh, to restore large areas of the peatland that had been cleared for the, for the rice scheme there. Mm -hmm. But they never actually got around to, uh, they were planning to block the uh, drainage canals and uh, re-wet the peat. Your evidence would suggest that unless you get the water table right up to the top, it's, it's scarcely worthwhile. That's what, what the data seems to suggest. But again, we don't have, there, there's, there are no data from, from uh, restoration schemes. And, and so, so, as I said, we have lots of natural experiments that suggest that this is the case. I think what we need is to actually isolate some variables on particular sites and, and, and validate that. There are, other, there are other situations where the, the slope you would draw doesn't necessarily go to the origin. And it can, it suggests that perhaps there are even some emissions when the, when the surface is flooded. There, there's a tremendous of physical reorganization of the peats that happen. And, and if you look at the history, if we put nitrogen into these peats, we've actually changed the carbon to nitrogen ratios. We may have irreversible changes. It, it, it doesn't mean just flooding it and you get the original peat back. That peat has gone from, from fibric, which, which has, fibric peat is what we call peat that you can see the, the, the original structure in, you can see branches, you can see roots, to, to, to sapric and hystric, which, which are, is peat that's much more decomposed. It's physically changed, it's chemically changed. And so we, it, it's, a, it's an inappropriate assumption to assume that we get the pristine state back if we just put the water back in. It's undergone a change, and some things are probably not reversible, and we don't know how much the, the carbon story is reversible or not. Yes, Eric. Yeah, well, obviously, as you point out, this uh, is a very uh, important topic, and there's a lot of uh, interests from a, variety, from a variety of sectors that would, would be affected. Um, in, to your knowledge, are there other peer-reviewed scientific studies that are going on right now or, are, or have, been, have been completed, either by universities or private sector parties, companies themselves, or, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, what is the status of this kind of research other than what C4 is doing? There's an awful lot, and, and actually for the IPCC, we, we reviewed, most of what we reviewed, C4 hadn't done. Um, so, so what was out there two years ago, which is when we, we, we closed our, our, our data, uh, when we closed the, the, the publications we were looking at for the data, there was nothing on the restoration. We know that there's some stuff going on right now in the X mega rice scheme. There, there are some studies that are, that are ongoing. Um, but I think we also need to look at independence. And there, some of it is being done by the private sector that has an interest. And, and this is where I think you know, independent, publicly funded research has a role to play. You know, getting scientists who don't have a stake in, in the outcome. 
saying something, because this is where a lot of the, the credibility is falling away. You know, the, if you look at the, the, the verified carbon standard, just put out a, a whole methodology based upon depth of, of, of drainage, written by NGOs and private sector companies that actually stand to make some money off of this, you know, if, if they implement carbon trading schemes or, or, or carbon uh, emissions reduction schemes. There's a conflict of interest in, in some of these, these groups because they're, they're, and they're putting forward methods in the verified carbon standard that actually favor their, their approaches to these things. So, so I, I think there's, there's a need for um, more independent, public, publicly funded, publicly executed research on this to, 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 to parse it. And, and I had some very interesting experiences with the private sector and with, with the, the NGO community in this IPCC process. And, and so, so saying, you know, it's not only tigers that maul you, when you get involved in, in tropical peatlands, is, is there's something behind that. Okay, I've been asked to close because we're already running over time. And uh, just allow one more question. I think that was over there. Yes. Dama? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Louis, for yeah. your presentation. I specifically like the, the ending. You know, there is still a lot to be done. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, my question goes more in the direction that uh, you mentioned the two methods, the mm -hmm. subsidence and the flux measurements. Yeah. And obviously when the IPCC is putting together uh, an emission factor, it cannot judge. Uh, if right. you have peer-reviewed literature, uh, it cannot judge if one is better than another. So there needs to be some type of reconciliation. So my question to you is, how was the reconciliation? Because you have two methods, very different. Mm -hmm. So how to put together one single number Mm -hmm. that represents the emission factor. And my second question is, if you eliminate um, one of the methods, like the subsidence method, for instance, would the result or the emission factor be significantly different yeah. than what you have today? Thanks. And I should say that, that Thelma actually chaired the, the committee that, that, uh, and, and, and kept the, 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 uh, the team focused on, on the task and, and answering these questions. Um, I think it's, it's, it's very important. I, I think we, we have come to a consensus. I think we, we've done the best we can to reconcile. We, we produced emissions factors that actually use both of them. And I, it, I think it, it, the, your second question, you, you probably already know the answer. When you take them both away, and this was actually what, what really helped, you get pretty close to the same answer. You know, it's about three tons difference, but you get three tons lower with the, with the, the, um, uh, with the flux-based method than you get with the substance method. And three is certainly within the error, the margin of error of any of the methods. So in the end, it doesn't really matter which method you use, and, and it, it shouldn't be a fight between the methods. What it should be is, is a fight to complete the methods and, and, get, and improve the science over time. And I think everybody was involved in that IPCC process took a really hard look at the methods and understands where they need to be improved. And I think perhaps one of the, 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 the most useful outcomes of that is that I expect we'll see much more rigorous papers in the future. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm getting finger signs that magically some, somehow time has run backwards, so we have a little, bit, a little more time and uh, Great. give a floor to you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, it was really interesting, uh, Lou. And um, we went to Rio, as you probably know, last, last month, and, mm -hmm. and you hosted that trip. Um, which is responsible for, as a single province for 15% of Indonesia's greenhouse gas emissions, most of which is from peat. And then Jokowi, of course, visited the president and uh, symbolically blocked a drain. Uh, Riau government has responded by saying they're going to block a thousand mm -hmm. drains. Is this a sensible thing to do? Is it realistic? How much are we going to save by doing that? It, I'm just asking these questions because I know this is a political arena, and it's tremendously charged mm -hmm. with, you know, the real-life political economy stuff that, that we live with every day here in Indonesia. But this sort of, there is this political commitment, and now they need help. Yep. So how can we help them understand what should be done and how you manage water tables uh, to, to stop greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah. I think that the best estimate we have from the science right now is that if you're successful at getting the water table to the surface and reflooding the surface, there's a reasonable probability that you will reduce the emissions. We cannot say that you're going you're to get zero emissions, but you certainly ought to be reducing the emissions. But here again, we're, 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 you, we're taking natural experiments and extrapolating them to a specific site. And what we need are, act, are, specific, are, are measurements on specific sites before and after that, that quantify just how much, and they're not hard to do. And, and we could have a reasonably better estimate in a year's time 
by getting some people out there on the ground a couple of months before these things happen and a couple of months after these happen. And we don't, you know, I don't think we need, you know, the, I, I think we, we need a little bit of, of, of this more solid evidence to quantify in a couple of different types of circumstances just what can we and can we not achieve. Um, and, and I think that the nutrient question is something that nobody's looking at at the moment. Um, and, and what can we do about changing nutrient management? Some of our, our work with CIRAD suggests that there's very little yield penalty in reducing nitrogen fertilizer earlier in the, the, the rotation. But there again, it's, it's, it's one fertilizer trial on one peat soil in one particular site. Um, and, and so we, we need to look at these a little bit more robustly and, and with, with more robust uh, experimental designs. And we're not talking about a decade to produce the next round of, 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 uh, of updates as we, are, we did with the IPCC. Um, we're, we're actually talking about a, a couple of years to, to, to put the, these numbers together. And, and provide guidance for, for large-scale investments that, that actually need to be achieving real emissions reductions and, not make, and making sure we're not wasting money by, by, by overstating or, or not losing opportunities by understating what's the impact that we've been able to achieve. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank the speaker. Let's give him a good clap of hands. <laughs>